Hey, we're back at it. This is His Word Unveiled. We've been in the book of 1 Samuel. Let's jump into our reading today. So um, let's just go right for it. Let's dig right in. Let's say, okay, God, this is your time. This is your moment. This, we're giving you permission to come to meet with us. We are saying we need you. We want you. We invite you to come to do something in our lives. So let's jump in. Let's see. Let's get excited about what God wants to show us and teach us through um, through his word. So our reading today, let's do this. 1 Samuel chapters 26 and 27. We're combining two. Chapter 27 is fairly short. So uh, even if it was long, let's do this. Let's get so excited. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Let's let him clean us up, clear everything out, and let's let God move. Let's let God teach us something. Let's let God change us today through the reading of his word, continuing to pour his goodness, who he is, into our lives so that everything can look different. So that when we walk, when we take every step we take and every breath we take, that it can be full of purpose, that it can mean something, that we're not just getting through life, we're not just watching the days go by. And every single action that we take and every single word that we speak, Let's let purpose take over. Let's let's do these things. Let's live this life with with things meaning something. With 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 eternal with eternal purpose. Let's let's just live. Let's live letting God be and and letting God move in us. And as we read these chapters, let's let's just be so intentional with doing that. With saying, "Okay, God, this means something." There is something in this that you want to teach me, that you want to show me, that you want to speak into my heart. There's something in this. Let's believe that. Let's claim that. Let's read knowing that. Let's let's read ready to be moved by that truth. God is a faithful God. And when we discipline ourselves and we move in obedience and we pursue him, then he will let us see him. He will unveil himself to us and he will take us places that we cannot imagine. Guys, life is too short to just, to just la 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 la. Like, it's too short. And everything we do, let's be purposeful. Let's be intentional. Let's not make or allow anything that we do to be in vain. Let's, let's just wrap it up and okay, God, what do you want to show me? What does this look like to you? What does this mean in you? How and what can I do to, to be closer, to be more intimate, to see better, to be more aware, to, to let this holy, um, this holy anger and, and brokenness rise up within me so that I am broken. I want, I'm choosing to do something about the things going on. That, that I see the sin and I see the hopelessness and I see the restlessness and it rises something up within me. Your spirit is rising things up in me to move, to move in that, to be real, to be purposeful in what I do so that other people, that they see that there is hope. That, that other people, that this world can see that, that there is something real that, that they may not have found yet. That's, that's what this just... That's purpose. That's life. If we're not living in a way that, that changes us and allows other people to be changed and brought into freedom, if we're not living in a way that does that, then, then what kind of life is that? What, what, what are we living for? What are, what's the point? Seriously, what's the point? If we're not connected to the Lord and, and hearing him speak and being moved by him into more and more and more, then what's the point? Let's allow everything we do to be so consumed with purpose. So let's get into our reading. 1 Samuel chapter 26 and 27. Go read. Go meet with the Lord. Go let things happen. Go let God happen. Just go. Just, just go. Be with him. Be quiet. Read with purpose, with your eyes open, with your heart open. Ah, he's so good. Lord, we pray that you pour out in this time. We pray that... Um, we pray for conviction. We pray for exposure. Lord, we pray that anything within us that needs just taken out, Lord, take it out. Let us see it. Let us be face to face with it. No matter how uncomfortable, no matter how, um, how the enemy wants us to feel shame because of it, Lord, may we see beauty in the things that we fall short in so we can see them, we can deal with them, we can know the root issue in them, and we can see your power come in and transform. Lord, just be just be who you are. Just come in. Just just let this stuff just just come out. Just 
just be out of us, Lord. Let it, let it be exposed. Let us see it so that we have freedom to move into more of you. Father, we want more of you. We want to live our lives in purpose. Lord, we want to be intentional. We want things to just flow naturally, that we're not striving, we're not confused, we're not wanting something but but constantly hitting that brick wall. Lord, just let it be real in us. Just reveal yourself to us in a way. Give us revelation in a way that we've never encountered before, we've never felt or seen before let something happen in us that that um, that just causes us to get it that causes us to get you father we need you we need you to just come on the scene of our lives and in a holy invasion and and do something in us get get all the junk out and fill us with all the good lord overwhelm us truly just overwhelm us with who you are, with how much you love us, and with how much purpose you have designed, established for us in our lives. Oh, Lord, us lead, Lord, lead us into that purpose. Lead us into that life that you died for us to have. Lord, we love you and we're so ready. We're so ready for today because we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. First Samuel 26. Okay, so our last chapter, our last video, we talked about David and Abigail and just this, this idea, this message, the truth of, of David saying, okay, I wanted to move in my anger and my emotions. I wanted to kill Nabal. I wanted to defend myself. But through chapter 25, David learned to step back and to let God be his defender, to let God take over, to trust that he is a righteous God that he will go after those who are wicked and he will bless and rise those up who are lift those up who are living in righteousness. David learned that lesson and may we learn that lesson and be changed by that. So in this chapter, um, chapter 26, we see again a couple chapters ago, we saw that David spared Saul's life when, when the men around him were like, hey, look, God has given Saul into your hand. Here's your time. You can easily kill him. Um, and we saw this, that David chose to spare Saul's life. He said, I am not raising my hand against the Lord's anointed. That Saul was anointed by God, therefore I am hands off. Hands off. Um, so we see this same idea in chapter 26. It says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hachila, which is before Jeshimon? So they come, they say, Look, David's here. Like, let's do this. You wanted David? Let's go after him. He's close. He's here. Um, let's make this happen. Verse 2 says, So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having, him, having with him 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. So we saw a few chapters ago where Saul said, Look, okay, I've sinned. You're more righteous than I. You've, you know, you're done this. I see that there's no evil in your heart. That, um, that you're not coming up against me. You spared my life. I'm the one who's evil towards you. You've spared mine in your gentleness. Okay, I'm done. I'm done chasing you. We're good. And they went separate ways. So we saw this, um, Saul speaking this. And then after some time, um, he was approached and saying, look, David's here. David, he is so close. He's so close. You can, you can taste it. He's so close. So let's go after him. And it says Saul rose up with 3,000 men going after David. It says that Saul camped in the hill of Hachila, which is before Jeshimon, beside the road, and David was staying in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him in the wilderness, David sent out spies, and he knew that Saul was definitely coming. So David hears that Saul is coming after him. David sends out spies. David sees where Saul is camped. Saul and his army, is Saul and the commander of his army, Abner, and his men were around this camp. They were camped out. David sees them sleeping. He sees them. Um, again, another opportunity where, um, you know, the Lord has given him into your hand. Like, why not? Why would the Lord make this happen if, if we weren't supposed to go and kill Saul? Why would he bring him to us? He is bringing Saul and his army to us. David is seeing him. They are sound asleep. Um, perfect, perfect opportunity. So, verse 6 says, Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. Then verse 8, Then Abishai 
said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with a spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him the second time. So again, men are coming at David and, and saying, Look, look at this. This is, this is God. This is God, again, bringing him to you. Why would he not want you to kill him if he orchestrated all of this, if he connected this, if he drew your enemy to you? And Abishai says, uh, let me strike him. I'm, I'll, I'll take care of this. I'm seeing this. We can move in the power of God. We can move in what God has set up for us to do and purposed for him to do. Let me strike him, and I'll only strike him once. I'll make this happen. Verse 9, though, David responds to Abishai like this. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? So he's saying, God anointed him. We, we would be covered in guilt if we went after this man. Though he is an enemy of ours, though he is trying to kill us, though he keeps telling me he's done, but yet he keeps pursuing me, though all those things, God has anointed him in this position as king, and it would be guilt on us if we rose up against him. Against... Um, how God positioned him in this time. Verse 10, David also said, as the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him or his day will come that he dies or he will go down into battle and perish. So David is giving this up to the Lord. We just saw this understanding in the last chapter where David had to step back and see God as his defender against Nabal. And he's saying, surely God will take care of this. Whatever Saul's timing is for him to die, it's not going to be on my terms. It's not going to be in my timing. It's not going to be in my way. God has anointed him as king. And when God chooses to take him out of this position of king, then God will do it. I love, I love that. And David's just like, hands off. This is all in God. I may not understand this. I may not like this. I may, you know, this, this attack, this being pursued is really, really intense. But this is on God. God, God has anointed him. God will take care of the entire situation, his life and, um, and his death. So verse 12, so David took the spear, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but now please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. So they sneak down as they are sleeping and they take Saul's spear that was in the ground at the, um, where his head, where he lay down to lay to sleep and then grab the jug of water that was next to him. They didn't harm him. They didn't touch them. Nobody woke up. Um, in verse 12, we see that for they were all asleep because a sound sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Again, how easy it would be for those excuses to come about. If the Lord put them in a deep sleep, then he is, he's wanting us to, you know, to kill, to pursue, to, to take vengeance into our own hands. Why would God put them in a deep sleep? how easily our flesh can jump in and say that. But we have to come back to the truth. We have to come back to what God said and how God did things. And God anointing King Saul, or Saul, to be king. And that's what David, that's what David was, standing, um, was standing on. So David didn't allow his mind to go there with all the excuses and saying, okay, well, God, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take care of this. God set it up. God is letting me do this. Hearing the voices of his friends, even Abishai, who was committed to him, willing to go down. He said, look, the Lord gave him up, just like he heard the last times. David is hearing the voices, these voices of the world, these voices going against the Lord over and over again. But he refuses to focus on that. He doesn't let his mind um, go there. He was focused on who God was and, and who um, or what God had done, on what God has said, and on who God had anointed. Um, he's staying focused on that and on what God had promised, on what he had already spoken, what he had already established. David made no room for excuses um, and no room for anything outside of God's truth. I love just the boldness and, and David just planting right there, saying no, but he is the Lord's anointed. And it's going to be on God's terms. If something happens to Saul, it's going to be on God's terms. So he goes and takes the spear and the jug. He goes back up to the mountain and then he calls out. And he calls to Abner. And he says, Abner, you know, the commander of Saul's army, what you've done is no good. You're not protecting your king. You're not protecting Saul. What are, what are you doing? You're not doing that great of a job. And Saul um, recognizes the voice of David and he yells out and saying, Is this your voice, my son David? We see this in verse 17. And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, the King. And David yells out, why? Why are you pursuing me? What have I done this time? 
I've proven to you already that I've spared your life, that there's no evil in my heart. Why then do you continue to pursue me? And he just yells out saying, look, I could have killed you once again. How many times do I have to prove this to you that I'm not going to kill you? You are the anointed king and I honor the Lord enough to not lay a hand on you. And he lets him know, look, where's your spear and your jug? I have them. I had that opportunity. The Lord is with me. The Lord is allowing whatever needs to be done to happen through me, that I am trusting the Lord in this. And I have not placed my hand on you. And just speaking this, this reverence, this respect, and how humbling is this? We can't forget the way that Saul is treating David. How many times do we justify and we say, oh, I don't need to be nice to them, or I can't respect them, or I'm not going to listen to them because of what they've done to me. We have no excuse. It doesn't matter how, how harsh, how undeserving of treatment that somebody places on you. If God has placed them in position, you know, as, as authority over you, whether that is a parent, whether that is a teacher, whether that is an, an officer, whether that is whatever, whoever, if they are placed in a position of authority over you, no matter how wrong they are, no matter how low they get, no matter how rude, no matter how harsh, no matter how, seriously, no matter how wrong, they can be so wrong. And by you submitting to their authority doesn't mean that you're going to roll over and, and take you know, take this and, and allow them to treat you that way. But by no means do we go at them and try to harm them. By no means do we go and we, we, we treat them with hate. We, we go after them and wish harm on them. David had every right, had every right in the world, had every reason in the world to go after Saul and to take care of him. He's against me, you know, thinking I'm just defending myself. God's anointed me as king and I can't die. I have a responsibility. I can, I can, Help, I have a ministry. He is coming at me to kill me. I'm just defending myself so that it doesn't happen. David could have easily thrown that out there. But what he remained focused on is the Lord and the Lord's anointing, <coughs> the Lord's anointing um, Saul. His focus is where our focus needs to be. And okay, Lord, I see you, I know you, and, and I'm letting you be in control. I'm letting you deal with all of this. Um, so... So incredibly good. So then verse 21, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. David replied, behold, the spear of the king. Now let one of the men come up and take it. The Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Again, this, this consistency, this pattern of David speaking and saying, look, the Lord is, um, the Lord is righteous. And that the Lord will repay each man for his righteousness. That he sees what we're doing. He sees that I've spared your life. He sees that I've trusted you know, trusted in him and the Lord will repay. David, David's stuck right there. No matter how hard life got, he remained there. God will reward me. God sees me. God will bless me. There is a harvest. There is a harvest for me as I follow obediently, as I walk this out with the Lord, trusting him, refusing to allow my emotions and my anger and my hurt to lead me. David knew that. He clung to that. May we cling to that. When we get all, all sulking and woe is me or angry and we see that we don't deserve this treatment around us, may we just stay put. May we stay in the presence of God and say, Lord, we trust you. We know, we know that the best is yet to come. We know that there's more to this. We know that this doesn't end in pain and suffering and anger and, and this vengeance and this heaviness and this evil and wickedness. It doesn't end in that. And David just clung to the Lord continuing to say, I know the Lord will repay me for my righteousness, so I'm going to be righteous. The Lord's going to repay me for my obedience, so I'm going to be obedient. The Lord is good. He is faithful. He sees, so I am going to keep focused on him, on that which is righteous, on that which is faithful, on that which is peace, which is this real purposeful movement. It's choosing that because we know who the Lord is. That is so, so powerful. Um. Okay, it ends up then in... Verse 25, then Saul said to David, blessed are you, my son, David, you will both accomplish much and surely prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. 
so good. So again, they go their own ways. But this carries into chapter 27 where it says, Then David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Then Saul then will despair of searching for me anymore in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. So it says, Then David... Um, arose and crossed over he and his 600 men he had 600 men following him with him and they went to Ahish the son of Maok king of Gath so they go into Philistine territory because David's like look if I go here Saul is not going to want to pursue me he's not going to want to come after me he's not going to want to come into Philistine territory so we see David going into the land of the Philistines it says that he brought his two wives Abigail and Ahinoam um, he and the 600 men who were with him, they settle in the land um, of the Philistines. Then it says, verse 5, Then David said to Ahish, if, um, if now I have found favor in your sight, let them give me a place in one of the cities in the country that I may live there. For why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So David is saying, look, I'm here with my men. You know, we come in peace. We're not coming to attack. We just ask if I found favor in your eyes, then give us a piece of land. We don't need to be where, you know, the capital is, where all the riches are, where, where all of this, where you live in royalty. Give us just the place over here where we're out of the way, where we're not bugging anyone. Then it says in verse 6, So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. So Ziklag is where David then settles in. It says the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Then we see just the raids that David goes on. So he's living in this land and he goes and they're fighting and, and he's becoming victorious and, and, and just conquering these other cities, these lands. And we see this relationship that is starting to form between David and Achish, the, the king of the Philistines. Um, just asking, hey, where did you go up to fight today? Who did you who did you defeat today? And this relationship that is beginning to form, this trust that, that the king of the Philistines, that he is trusting David. So verse 12 says, So Achish believed David, saying, He has surely made himself odious among his people Israel. Therefore, he will become my servant forever. So this trust that happens, David is here in the Philistine, the land of the Philistines. Um, Saul is not wanting to come after him because he's in the land of the Philistines. And that's just where we're at in the story. Um, he is in Ziklag, which we'll um, read more about that in the next few chapters. So that is that. That's where we're at. So good, more truth, so powerful. I love that it's just chapter by chapter and we're really just taking the time and giving God space to teach us and to show us just more and more. I've read through the word so many times, um, but there is something about just going through chapter by chapter and really wanting to see, really wanting um, to know what's going on, to to take the time to to see beneath what we just, you know, what's on the surface. What is there? What? How deep does God want to take this? What more does he want to show us? So good. So powerful. And when we're disciplined and we're pursuing the Lord, mm, he's going to show up. He, he is going to unveil, reveal himself to us. So that's what I want. That's what I'm choosing. That's what this is, his word unveiled, walking through and, and really reading with purpose, living with purpose, living expecting to be changed. So good. Thanks so much for walking this out with me. Um, yeah, we're just going to keep rolling on into one video at a time and, and going through the entire Word of God. So hoping that you join me on my next video and, and we'll just keep moving um, further and further into more of who God is. So good. That's it. Leaving you with that. See ya.